Speaker Series. Our speaker today is Dr. Lloyd Gavin. Uh, Lloyd earned his bachelor's degree in math at Xavier University, Louisiana, his master's at the University of Kansas, and his PhD at Illinois Institute of Technology. His expertise, functional analysis, and some ability factors. Lloyd was my professor 41 years ago when I was an undergraduate at Sac State. He became my mentor. He gave me great advice, set me on a path that put me here today. So I'm very again. honored to introduce Lloyd Gavin to you. He's our speaker and look forward to hearing his talk. Thank you, Lloyd. First and foremost, I want to thank those people who invited me and I consider this an honor and a blessing. Be assured that nothing that I say will challenge your mathematical abilities. So rest. This is just going to be a story, my story. Last May, my wife and her two sisters decided to celebrate the youngest sister's birthday on a cruise to Mexico. I would have been the only male on that cruise, so I chose not to go. Instead, I chose to take a trip to Yosemite National Park, a desire that I've always wanted to do. Having lived in Sacramento for the past 45 years, I hate to admit this, the trip to Yellowstone was my first trip in this part of the country. No surprise to you, the trip unveiled a resting and breathtaking scenery. In awe, I photographed whatever captured my attention while driving and at various stops. The Yellowstone signature attractions were my highest priorities. The bisons, the geysers, and the fascinating ever-present rushing streams. And one in particular, the one where I saw the little duck seemingly trapped, floating down this fast moving stream. I departed the park and I instructed the car to map a trip to Butte, Montana to visit one of my successful students. Professor Rich, Richard Rossi, one of Montana's esteemed mathematical statistician, author, and a certified, certified vice fisherman guide. During our reacquaintance, he asked me to return to the university and share some thoughts with you. Now, I haven't been in retirement for 20 years, devoid of mathematical activity. I had to ponder 
this request. After a few days, I consented. Now, who are you, who's talking to you? I was born in Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana. My father had at most a third grade education, typical for most black men in Louisiana at that time. Our table talk wasn't about stocks, farm animals, mining ore, federal politics, nor how to navigate a university to gather an effective education. I entered the university without any guidance. The role of the university and how to effectively grab and hold on to what I would need for the rest of my life. None of that. While studying, my thoughts always focused on graduating and hoping for a job that didn't exist for black men in Louisiana at that time. As critical as this, this, this discussion is for some of you, I want to take a, a short digression. It's going to be an instructive digression. Of the sceneries that you saw in my travels to Yellowstone and Butte, three countrysides stood out while preparing this talk. They actually captured my mind and they would not let go. The first was that lush green scenery, trees growing along the countryside, coming down the mountain. I saw that and I, I was actually jealous of the people who had the opportunity to live in an oasis such as that. The second was the majestic snow-capped white mountain ranges in the big skies. I had never seen anything like that. I lived in Sacramento. I lived in Chicago. I lived in New Orleans. When I looked up, what do you think I saw? Certainly I didn't see mountains. Snow in New Orleans. Now I think they have hurricanes, but they didn't have them when I was there. But of the sceneries that I saw, one of them seemed to have captured the essence of life more than all the rest of them. And that was the, that one. Namely, the duck flowing in this fast moving stream down this rushing stream. It still occupies my mind. Now the lush green scenery, what does it say to me? Tranquility. I don't think there's a human being on the face of the earth who does not want tranquility. That's what I saw. I say, these people have a life of tranquility. I lived in a city. Gunshots, sirens, people stealing. I didn't have tranquility. The duck on the rushing stream, it morphed in my mind to a, a person stuck in a situation, trapped, trying to get out, saying to himself, how did I get in this? What am I going to do to get out of it? The geysers. The ever-present geysers threatening imminent turmoil, revealing the true nature of life. Namely, life is not a collection of isolated moments, easily identified as pleasant or unpleasant. It's a confluence of many happenings, some visible to you, and you can enjoy some of them but most are hidden from you 
and they will affect you. Like the rapid moving streams in the park, these happenings are flowing to their own season to favorably or unfavorably erupt in your life. Casting you either as a star, look what I did, or as an object of a Shakespearean tragedy in a cascade of uncontrolled events. I hope for each one of you that the duck in the fast moving stream portends life gliding to a goal that will benefit you and the society that you live in. John Kennedy chiseled in our history that you are intricately united to our society when he said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. So you must choose one of two paths. The first choice, a path to assure your personal success, seeking something from society. The second choice, a caring, philosophical approach that enhances the moral order where you live and developing everything around you. There, you're giving to society. Choose the first, and you place yourself in a rushing stream, possibly attaining your goal, but risking having no one with whom to share it, and possibly having ch little chance to escape the effects of your choice. Be advised, neither of these choices guarantees a life of tranquility, the lush green scenery. But the second choice offers you peace of mind and a good life with others. That's the gift that the university is offering to you. The gift that is asking that you share with others what your gifts have, you have, so that they can live a good life as well. Now the reasonable question is how do you do this? It's easy to talk about things, but how do you go about doing it? Well, when the university granted you entrance, she entered a relationship with you. She became a second mother. She strived to shape you into her own image. The image of a productive, caring, moral, informed, lifelong learning citizen. But during your four years of gestation, she nurtures you with precepts from a field that you chose. Then she certifies you to society. While in our care, she attempts to assure that you master those precepts by offering seminars to expand your enlightenment. Various opportunities through diverse clubs, educational experiences to other countries, and by presentations to selected talks given by professors and other people who can share their life story. She does this all for one reason, to widen your views of the same precepts that you're learning in the classroom. So you can apply them to many different situations 
as others have applied them. She further strengthens your cognitive skills through novel solutions to various problems. To prepare you for problem solving when you separate from the university. Successful problem solving requires total brain development. So she avails you to the arts, visual, smoke, spoken, and auditory. From the Shakespearean experiences, I learned the raft of tragedy. Stay away from that. From Machiavellian experiences, I gleaned the method to seize control of a large system, lead it, and effectively manage it. From the Tocquevillian experiences, I garnered a plan to effectively examine a process, to learn it, and to understand it, a process that was previously foreign to me, a process I didn't understand. From Hamiltonian experiences, I gathered an appreciation of timing, when to execute a bold act, when to act, how to act, and in what manner. Within this nutrient mix, the university incubates you to become a caring, productive, moral person, equipped to guide your world, and ultimately, the university herself. In other words, the university really is preparing you to answer that question. What can you do for society? Yes, you have responsibilities to society. So what are they? As a prophet of truth, the university endeavors to shape you to, to value truth. She expects you to reject beliefs based on personal perspectives. She excoriates all who holds to group instincts. Having ground you and tested and verified precepts, she demands that you become a warrior for truth. She arms you with logic and expose so you can expose and destroy anything that's not true around you. She nurtures you to resist all pressures of falsehoods. That was a reason for exposing you to Machiavelli, de Tocqueville, Plato, Aristotle, Hamilton, Lincoln, Joyce, Mark Twain, Dr. Martin Luther King, and others. She intended them to constantly whisper to your psyche, resist falsehood. The major faiths also stress these lessons, shun self-satisfaction, embrace empathy for others, and hold others to the same measure that you hold yourself. I learned all of these things, and I came to cherish them after my separation from the university by living a life of giving. The gift that the university is offering you to adapt. I'm going to close my thoughts sharing with you my most invaluable university gift. Years ago, I published these thoughts. I had to think about them. And I published it under the title, A Love Affair. So I'm going to read it to you exactly as I wrote it. It was almost 20 years ago that I did this. Against the wishes of her sister, I was to see her again. 
It had been 20 years since our last meeting. She was always logical and cogent. Now in a cryptic letter, she revealed she's going to the mother house. Having never questioned her about personal matters, I responded with a very short letter. Very short. Are you in pain? End of the letter. Days later, I received a letter from one of her sisters reporting her diminished condition and a phone number to St. Elizabeth's Hospital. On three separate occasions, I called to learn about her condition. Always I got the response, she's resting. Some days later, her sister called and announced she's been in a coma for a week. Without a thought, I immediately said, I'm coming. The voice at the other end of the line attempted to dissuade me from my quick, but with her quick authoritative response. Don't, you can't do anything. But responding to an internal juggernaut, I found myself on a flight from Sacramento to Philadelphia. Upon arrival, I called her sister for directions. She said, wait there, I'll come and get you. She arrived about 40 minutes later and we drove. Then she reiterated the folly of my trip. I didn't respond. We arrived at the hospital and began a walk down a long, dim, gray corridor, poorly lit. Halfway into the corridor, we turned into a shorter hall leading to her room. A nurse entering that wing's nursing station spotted us and summoned other nurses at that nursing station. They entered the hall and observed our approach. As we advanced, I felt a cloud of positive feeling. Apparently, they surmised I was the consistent caller from California. I sensed that they wanted to reach out and touch me to welcome me. We passed the nurse's station and my guide entered her room. Following her, I stopped in the doorway, frozen with anxiety. An internal voice demanded of me, why are you here? Her sister approached her bedside and looked upon her. The room was darkened from outside light by window coverings. Its only light was a small dim light in a far corner, an array of light from the hall, splitting the darkness to the head of her bed. An audio recording poured out a spiritual rendition of my university's alma mater. Her sister turned to me, still frozen in the doorway, but now with a more tender turn, tone. And she said, come in. I entered the room and she said, talk to her. The sound of her microchipped ID, IV, and her respirator voiced their function to forestall the inevitable. 
that inner voice again demanded of me, what do you say to a comatose person? With a quick breath behind me, I began to tell her the news of our mathematical community. I told her that David was lecturing in the Soviet Union. Then I began to tell her about students she had taught. I said, Chuck is lecturing in Oslo and Paris. Elsie is completing her master's degree at LSU. Shirley is lecturing at the University of Kentucky. Ronald is completing his PhD at the University of Miami. Now, less anxious and donning 210 pounds, I said, I now weigh 210 pounds. Her left eye open. The last time she saw me, I weighed 165 pounds. My weight was always a source for her jabbing. A nurse entered the room to check her machines and her conditioning. She noticed the eye was open and she asked me, what is your relationship to her? I said, she's the mother of my academic life. Apparently that pleased her because an ear-to-ear -ear smile inched onto her face. But racked with the pain of bone cancer, she slowly closed her eye and a smile melted from her face. I said, I will return to see you. The next morning, her sister told me she died at 3 a.m. Lying before me was Sister Miriam Frances Quinn. She was Irish American, a Catholic nun, a mathematician, my college mentor. She was concluding the final hours of her life, the last 40 years of which, having taught young black men and women at the Xavier University of Louisiana. From her, I learned how to be a teacher, how to be patient and wait for the struggling student how to nurture the promising student. But most importantly, I learned the importance of knowing my raison d'etre, why I exist. She believed her creator pleasured to bring her into existence to do his work. So moved, she devoted her life to praising him by teaching downtrodden black youth in Louisiana. She died in pain, but in peace. Rest in peace, good and faithful servant. Universities teach how science and logic can better life's conditions. So I encourage you to master the lessons of science and logic. Universities do not teach the reason why you exist. I strongly encourage you to seek the reason for your existence then you also will know a peace beyond understanding. That's the invaluable gift I got from my university.
With the remaining of my time, I would like to present an example. The example will come before you on the screen. The example is an argument between two men. One, a naturalist, so an atheist, and the other, I don't know what his tendency is, but he's a philosopher, and he tends to seek to make rational Christian belief. And he wrote this. Imagine, imagine a world that is very much like ours, except that evil doesn't exist. People in this world are much like us and seem able to make their own choices. But they always end up choosing good rather than evil. In that world, the rel relevant data is the absence of evil. How would that be construed as far as theism is concerned? He says, it's hard to doubt that the absence of evil would be taken as strong evidence in favor of God. It's hard to doubt that. If humanity simply evolved according to natural selection, without any divine guidance or inferences, we would expect to inherit a wide variety of natural impulses. Some for good, and some for not so good. The absence of evil in the world would be hard to explain under atheism, but relatively easy under theism. So it would count as evidence for the existence of God. But if this is true, the fact that we do experience evil is unambiguous evidence against the existence of God. If the likelihood of no evil is larger, than the, larger under theism, then the likelihood of evil is larger under atheism. So the evil existence increases our credence that atheism is correct. Needless to say, his belief is the God hypothesis is not real. Before I go on, I just want to go through a little review. I know since most of you have had statistics and mathematics, this review is not necessary, but just to make certain we are all on the same page. For independent events, when A and B are independent, to get the probability of A and B occurring, we multiply their probability. That's what we do in probability theory. For complementary events, uh, A and B, we add their the probabilities of their complements. Uh oh, I'm doing something wrong. Then there's the likelihood principle, stated this way. If you're given 
competing hypotheses. Let's call them H1 and H2. And an observation. If the observation is more probable under H1 than it is under H2, then O counts as evidence in favor of H1. That's what we normally do in statistics. Seems like it's, well, it's more likely come from here because it seems like this is where what's given is being supported through the observation. Now the critic of that statement that I read earlier decided he would formalize everything that was re I read to you earlier. He started off by saying, let P be a, represent probability, and let E represent the statement, evil exists, and let T represent the statement, God exists. This is where he starts this off. Remember he said, if evil doesn't exist, that seems to be giving more credence that there is a God or there's something that has interfered. You remember when I read that? You want me to go back and read it again? Then he made this statement. If evil doesn't exist, Oh, did I read that correctly? If evil doesn't exist under God, I'm sorry, if evil doesn't exist under God is greater than evil existence under no God, then we know, he said this was some probability that evil is more likely under Oh, I left off some. Even is more likely under atheism than under theism. That first T should have that thing right there. That should be that. I'm sorry. Then he says, this means that evil under atheism is a stronger hypothesis than evil under God. And from that he claims evil therefore reduces my credence of believing in God which is this number over here. It has decreased. Now the critic acts Ask, is this a good argument showing that the existence of evil produces some disconfirmation for the existence of God? Now I copied this. This is not me. I just copied this. He says no. Oops. He says he says the argument that was given when I first read is not a very strong argument. And this is what he's putting up to buttress that. He said, Christian theists has always postulated that God created humans to possess free will. So God cannot make a person do good or to refrain from evil because he would be violating their free will. In other words, God allows human beings to do and make whatever decision they want, good or evil. It's your choice. So he starts off by saying, under free will, suppose in this world, this world he postulated, Imagine, remember, P is, the, P is the smallest probability of doing good and refraining from evil. And he says, let's take that to be 0.9. Because remember, these people tend to do good. So he says, let's choose 0.9. 0.9 is 
the probability that every person in this world chooses good by independence, free will, independence, multiplied probability, is P raised to the n power, where n is the, the population of, of that society. Let's take the society of the state that I live in. California has 39,780 people. So think about raising 0.9 raised to the 39,780th power. What do you think you're going to get? He says the likelihood that someone would choose evil is one, because that number right there is practically zero. Oops. So in this special world, this is what he writes. Under the God hypothesis, the probability of no evil, P to the N, is nearly zero. So I'm going to ask you, how does this affect that argument? How do you think that affects the argument? If this probability is nearly zero, Okay, now I'll go back so you can see how he gets that. Here's the thesis, here's the thesis about, this is the thesis hypothesis. Either a person, either there's evil or there, there isn't evil, so that sum should be one. Here's the atheist hypothesis evil or not evil, it has to sum to one. So all I did, I actually, that's why I put this in blue, all I did was take this, this second line right here and put it up here. And then, I, then I move this number right here to the left side and this number right here to the right side. And when you do that, this is what's his original assumption. That is, he says, under the God hypothesis, evil, lack of evil, is, should be greater than under the atheist hypothesis. So, So that's how he concluded this side. That number must be bigger than that number. And now he's saying, okay, I have two competing hypotheses, and evil is stronger under this one, so that means I should lessen my belief on the guard hypothesis. That's this last line. This is what he wrote. And this man is saying, that's a weak argument. And I'm asking you, why do you think that's a weak argument? I mean, he just followed the rules. Or do you think it's a weak argument? <laughs> Maybe he's wrong. Is he wrong? Well, Look at this, the original statement. It's hard to doubt. It's hard to doubt that the absence of evil would be taken as strong evidence, strong evidence in favor of the existence of God. But look what we have. Where is it? This statement is saying this number is almost zero. So what is the one that's below it close to? So there's the strong doubt thing is gone. That's what I think he's fighting about. In other words, he's saying both of these hypotheses look like they're giving me the same conclusion. I can't really determine. 
That's what I think. I would like to know what you think. Well, maybe you don't want to tell me. <laughs> well, okay. That's all right. You don't have to tell me. That's what I think he means. That one statement up here, right here, strong evidence. There's no strong evidence when one number is almost zero and the other one below it has to be equally almost zero. No strong evidence. Now, I want you to know that the person who wrote that came back and he made his statement. He says, look, every time I present an argument, you theists always come up with something like to trick up my argument. But that doesn't mean I'm wrong. And he's right. <laughs> he's absolutely right. But I was just interested in whether you would follow this, this type of reasoning because it uses simple, simple ideas from probability, you know. And it is something to think about. And it's things that you can do. See, this is what the university wants you to do. Read something that someone has written and use what you've learned to apply it to and say, no, it's not right. This is right. I support this because this is right. That's what the precepts they're giving you for. They're not giving it to you because you want a piece of paper and get a job. They want you to think. They want you to be able to help somebody. And that's what all of this is about. Now, during the close of last week, we saw two giants separated from life. Senator John McCain and Sister Soul Aretha Franklin. It's interesting how the world responded to these two people leaving life. Neither one of them sought riches. Both sought one thing, I will give the best I have to the society I live in. That's what the university is here for. That's what she wants you to do. You can seek money, that's all right. But she wants you to help the society in which you live. Grow it, make it better. You may not get the praise that either one of those two got, but that's not important. But in your circle, you will get that praise. Your mother will say, that was my daughter. Your daughter will say, that was my mother. That's what you want. You don't want, when it's all over, two kids fighting over $12 million. What is that? Doesn't mean a thing. You want them to say, that was my mother. Look what she did for me. Look what she did for this society. Thank you.